We are on the French-Italian border, surrounded by the majestic Alps. Under a turbulent sky, our team wound its way to our next ominous destination. Disturbing, not because it is a mental asylum, but because it has a dark past. Excitement and anxiety together. Once a cement factory, it was converted into an asylum in 1871. The three-story structure, shaped like an infinity sign with two internal courtyards, kept with the dominant psychiatric thought of the time, containment. Rakaniji Manicomio Asylum, also known as Nightmare Hill, was tucked away in a remote corner of Northern Italy. The story begins in 1904, when the Italian authorities passed a law that would usher in an era of horror for the mentally ill. By emphasizing the alleged danger posed by patients, the legislation allowed asylums to impose a system of punishment and control. Once it became law, these corridors became places of wide-scale suffering. Patients were dragged kicking and screaming down these halls, and then forced into baths either full of ice or scalding water. Doctors thought such torment would shock the illnesses from their patients' minds. A kind of superstition had substituted for modern medicine. These poor souls, dragged from the baths, were brought back to claustrophobic rooms, trapped in isolation for weeks. All part of the treatment, of course. Another torture was electroshock, or malaria therapy. The practice of injecting malaria into patients to cause shivering seizures. Patients died on these rudimentary examination tables. The sadism had no limits. The fascists in power raised the bar. The world was ignorant of Italy's practice of keeping mental patients in wire cages, of imprisoning them in shock boxes with blaring music. The torture was meant to erase the traces of their past, but left even greater scars in the survivors. By the 1960s, some physicians were beginning to question the psychiatric orthodoxy. They argued for a mental health system that focused on the welfare of patients, not punishment and isolation. A heroic doctor named Franco Basaglia was the leader of this movement. Basaglia was horrified by what he witnessed in the asylums. The scientific debate he promoted in the public forum soon led to the gradual closing of the mental hospitals. Rakonigi Mental Hospital was only one of those closed in 1981. Even after closing, its very presence, like the other asylums, continues to evoke memories of a dark and disturbing time in medical history.
On the Asian shore of the Bosphorus, there is a group of factories known as Baco's Shoes. Laid out over 18 hectares, this facility's history goes back to the beginning of industrialization of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. Once upon a time, the finest and most notable products of leatherworking were made here. While the factory had many clients, both domestic and international, its main patron was the Ottoman military. The raw leather that was brought in from Anatolia was quickly wetted and covered in lime to prepare for tanning. Even though the Ottoman state had adapted the modern manufacturing mentality, the products from this factory mainly came from the hands of craftsmen. After the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the founding of the Republic of Turkey, the factory kept producing and was taken over by Sumer Bank in 1933. It continued to provide quality shoes for both civilians and the military. As a result of rapid industrialization, an uncontrolled amount of waste was being dumped into the sea. In 1999, it was closed down. But what would be the fate of this massive area? It waited inert until 2005, when an investor took over the factory. As a historic site, it could not be demolished, but in a brilliant move, it was turned into a movie lot. The facility had many historic buildings and large warehouses perfect for filmmakers. The era of shoemaking had ended for this factory, but a new dawn had risen. The old guest house was turned into a jail that was wholly authentic. The atmosphere was so creepy to begin with, art directors had no difficulty recreating the scenes. Everything was in place to make a good film. The location of the factory was so valuable that numerous projects regarding its fate were discussed. The worst scenario for these buildings, so ready to become everything and anything, would undoubtedly be their destruction. For now, at least, the Baco Shoe Factory continues to tell our stories. In our search for giant investments gone to waste, we heard of a fascinating story in the northwest of Europe. On the way there, we all wondered the same thing. If it took 80 years to realize it caused more harm than good, it would be very interesting. The cooling tower of Belgium's IM electric power plant is reaching for the sky like a dystopic dream. This monster was created with reinforced concrete for the coal-burning power plant and for years was supported by the wind. Each time it opened its giant mouth, it would spew steam into the sky. So much steam with it, it nearly changed the climate of the region. Descending into the heart of this alien-like structure was as eerie as meeting a biomechanical being. It is inarguably an engineering wonder in its symmetry. The size of the inner room alone is equal to other plants across the globe as the smokestack, built in 1921, was tasked with cooling the largest thermal reactor plant in Belgium. The 
These moss-colored metal plates make up the lungs of the stack. We enter its core to take a closer look. Even after all these years, a sharp metallic tang lingers in the air. Wind was taken into the tower through passages in its base, allowing the cooling of one and a half million liters of hot water per minute before it was released into the sky. Once it was determined that the plant was responsible for 10% of Belgium's carbon dioxide emissions, it was shut down that same year, and the smokestack became a vortex, pulling curious explorers to itself. Sachsenhausen camp, only one of the slave camps of Nazi Germany. Between 1936 and 1945, over 100,000 people were massacred. An area of a few hundred meters square and the decayed consciences of the Nazis were enough to accomplish this task. The Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler would later use the phrase completely modern to describe it. To be sure, it had all the means to torture prisoners, perform experiments on them, then slaughter them. Its first victims were German citizens, political criminals, homosexuals, and clergy of various religions. Until November 9th, 1938, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. That night, the homes and workplaces of Jews were smashed and burned. People were imprisoned and brought to this concentration camp. When the Second World War exploded, this place became the center of hell. For the prisoners, hungry and sick, the only sound heard, boots marching, the only sight, looming shadows. These were the harbingers of death. People were torn away from their loved ones. For those left behind, living was worse than death. This indescribable suffering was actually caused by humans. This eclipse of the mind quickly spread throughout the Nazis. Until its closing, the Sachsenhausen concentration camp had imprisoned over 200,000 people. Today, the camp is kept open as a memorial. It is a memorial to honor the thousands that were massacred together with their dreams. Tragically, the only freedom for them were their ashes released into the wind. traveled far from the depths of a submerged village 
to an enigmatic castle set on the heights. What we had come to see was so large and convoluted, it was impossible to decide where to begin the story. We could only do justice to the dizzyingly beautiful but deadly silent place with a fairy tale. It was the last days of August in Germany. A deep silence reigned over the Witzenberg Chateau. But the whinnying of the horses signaled that not all was well. Ever since, the noble owner of the chateau, the Baron Munchausen, had left on his high-strung colt to join a hunting party. No one had breathed a word. He had been sent off with opulent ceremony. No wild animal stood a chance against this noble hunter, but the Baron did not return. The horses in the stable died. The clustered had no strength left to endure. The Grand Chateau started to come undone, like pieces of a puzzle disturbed. This was only a fragment from the stories of a thousand-year saga. But what of its past? The chateau's fate was cast in the ninth century. The stones were woven to house a monastery, but it was mysteriously abandoned until, a few centuries later, the monk's tale began. The ever-expanding castle grew into a fortress. The passing years have swept away the inhabitants of Witzenberg. Many sounds have echoed throughout the walls of the castle, but none remain. While in the 1900s, the Buchenwalds, descendants of Baron Munchausen, came into ownership, the Second World War finished this family's story as well. The occupation of the Soviet soldiers was the horizon of the ancient castle. After, It was never the same. It was handed down, over and over discarded. There is no one else but the rays of light streaming through its windows. And there are places the sunlight doesn't touch. Every step of the chateau is weighed by a monolithic loneliness. There is no happy ending or jolly tale written by this castle. In Witzenberg, the place of petrified dreams, it awaits destruction by a final storm. Silence reigns in Lviv this time of the year. People withdrawn to their homes The streets are deserted. The departing summer leaves behind the seeds of new stories. Strolling around the old buildings, we find a place preparing for the coming fall. It was a timeless place, alive even while the city slept. The statues embracing the walls seem poised, waiting expectantly for an important night. The footsteps of imaginary guests begin to crescendo. The historic house of scientists. The heartbeat of the city was preparing for a new year. Here it stood before us. We were at the home of fun, celebration, and science. This was a magnificent building that served the Ukraine's wealthiest families and scientists for many years. It was one of the extraordinary examples of neo-Baroque architecture. It was built in 1898 by a famous Austrian architectural firm. On the eve of the new year, 
people would flock to revel, try their luck in the casino, and enjoy the delicious offerings of its restaurant. of opulence, its eight grand salons were ready for the new year. The countdown began, the champagne popped, and 120 years ago, people's hearts were filled with the glitter of the new year. So it was, an old dream had nightly by the historic house of scientists. We are somewhere where old tunes are trapped in an old broken music box. There is no sound at all. The halls lengthen behind us. With each step we take in this place, we become a little more lost. We feel the air, cold, in our lungs get heavier with each breath. We've long forgotten where we are. On looking here at this labyrinth from above, we can see cylindrical buildings side by side and the cold corridors that connect them together. This wasn't a colony founded on another planet. It wasn't a bunker or nuclear facility. Though difficult to believe, it was a hotel. Its architecture was so strange, we couldn't imagine it in its prior life as a hotel. There were things everywhere, but they were all strewn round and unrecognizable. The hotel's connection to the world had been cut off completely. The places children had once run about were deserted. How had it become this way? We continued our research and we succeeded in finding a few clues. The hotel is the Opuszczone Okraglaki, 100 kilometers outside Warsaw, Poland's capital city. These circular buildings were once host to holiday makers escaping city life. It was designed so that each room had uninterrupted daylight. The 7,000 square meter facility situated within the forest was safe and quiet. It housed a tennis court, a gym for sports, activity and entertainment areas. Children, let loose by their parents, could run around freely and play to their hearts content with no worries. Their laughter still echoed among the remnants. The adults, free from worrying about their kids, could pass their time in deep conversation. Young lovers came for weekends away from prying eyes. Meals were taken surrounded by song. Plans were made while sipping drinks. Now it is filled with the ragged memories of those golden days. The only sound heard from the music box now is rusty metal squeaks. The 120-room hotel lost its luster after an economic crash. After its bankruptcy in 1996, only a ruin remains. No one was brave enough to take on the task of revitalizing it. Demolishing it is costly. When it can neither exist nor cease to exist, we are confronted with the sad remains of a ruthless system. 
The arms of the turbulent Euphrates River reach throughout Mesopotamia. It flows through the hearts of green valleys, fertile plains, and even bustling cities. The village of Savashan in Halfeti, a lost story hidden by the Euphrates. A story that began thousands of years before, but was interrupted when the mighty river swallowed half of the village. Then a search began. Before it was flooded, the village, many hearths thrived. The Euphrates lived alongside. It had not yet consumed them. The siren call of the city had not yet been cut short. Savashan was a quiet Anatolian village. Its name came from long ago. Children grew up along its shore. It was known to have a wide array of fruits from its fertile soil. Its inhabitants lived off of its soil. The homes still smell of earth for this reason. Master craftsmen showed off their skills balancing the roofless houses on the shoulders of narrow streets. The shadows of Anatolian civilization's past still linger over these abandoned houses. Once the last villagers left and life stood still, there was little difference between the dry houses and the submerged, but the memories are vibrant. Many objects can be found scattered. They are busy decaying away. Ironically, it all comes back to the water. The water that gave life is the same water that took it from this village. The Birgic Dam on the Euphrates was opened in 2000. The state closed the region after buying the houses from the villagers. The waters rose almost 60 meters, and 80% of the village was flooded. The village was relocated 15 kilometers away, but the inhabitants were forced to leave behind much more than they brought with them. The village, isolated from the living, could only reminisce. These recollections kept the stone buildings erect. Everywhere people touch, a story begins. Much like a story without a hero can have no end, the village of Savashan has no resolution, for now. The villagers sometimes visit their old homes, most are ramshackle, but seem ready to begin where they had left off. There are plans to restore some of the buildings for tourism. Even if their owners, a short distance away, cannot claim them, many champions from around the world may join the exploit. And who can tell? Maybe the arc of the story will change course. The houses may be revitalized. The Euphrates solitude may come to an end. Legends, whispered from ear to ear, blended into the river's waters, set off. This call, it was to seek the hero of an unfinished tale. After hours on the seemingly endless roads of the German Autobahn, we reach a quiet city. The spot we're looking for isn't from ages ago, but from a near past. 
We've heard that years ago, people seeking cures were often sent scurrying along these silent streets. Their only aim was to reach this three-story wooden house. What was it that ailed these poor souls? What did they find in this now deserted old house that soothed their pain? Those suffering urological problems came to the best doctor they knew. He carried the weight of years of experience, had exceeded great distances to earn his reputation. This house belonged to the man who treated those patients in unbearable pain, Dr. Klaus Kraft. Each corner of the house has the marks of both the doctor and his patients. On our arrival, the many emotions lingering from the 1950s to the 80s were wedged into the house. We could feel them all. First, the music started. Then the invasion of sense. We were overwhelmed from the onslaught of memories. The exploration of the building was becoming a dangerous endeavor. Every point of the dilapidated building was sounding alarms. Descending the rotting stairs a floor, we reached Dr. Klaus's examination room. It was as if we had time traveled back to the 1960s between the floors. It was all left as it was. It is hard to explain the impact this had on us. The feeling that, had we come ten minutes earlier, we may have caught an operation in progress. What frightened us most, though, was the tables and chairs where patients yielded to the doctor. Even though the rubble and scattered objects covered them, they were there all the same. Just imagining the pain and fear experienced in this room was enough to overwhelm us. Dr. Klaus's residence was here as well. We wandered through the remains of his belongings on the upper floor. Photographs, books, mementos from travels. We gazed at the library of this bilingual and most intellectual doctor. The more we wandered, the more we learned about him. The one thing we had not expected to find was his gravestone. The doctor's living area was in worse shape than his office. There was a heavy odor, remains of shriveled food, upturned bottles and broken glass greeted us with each step. We started to hear strange sounds. We knew they weren't real, yet it became more difficult to distinguish reality from our imagination. The higher we went, the more distinct the sound became. The romantic melody whispered into our ear was emanating from the things about us, vibrations from the past. The song was of the passing of a life filled with love. Dr. Klaus and his wife clasped hands until the very last moment.
The time had come. In 1988, Dr. Klaus received his final call. There was one last journey that the good doctor had to travel. One that would take for all eternity. at the mercy of the winds. All that remained floating about were the orphan souvenirs of finished life. A short distance from the city, we come to a forest. We hope to find a way in so we can get to the place we have heard very interesting things about. It was hard getting in, but harder still to describe what we found. Thousands of flashing lights, children's laughter, smell of popcorn and music. When you enter an amusement park, these are the things you expect to experience. It's been this way since the 17th century. As far as we know, of course. In Berlin's Spree Park, those experiences are years behind it. Its tragic tale tells of those who were entertained, but also of those who suffered. It all began in 1969 when the park opened on a 30-hectare lot where hundreds of thousands of people visited every year. Back then, it was a culture park operated by the government. Until the fall of the Berlin Wall, when the speed of bureaucracy left the Ferris wheel in the dust. Circumstances changed rapidly in 1989. The amusement park was neglected. Entrepreneur Norbert Witt took over the park when it was privatized in an unanticipated auction. Witt was a wealthy visionary. He bought new rides, added thrilling experiences to the amusement park. The result? Visitors reaching a million and a half each year. Yet, as all was going smoothly, accidents ending with fatalities occurred. Norbert Witt revamped the park once again, an attempt to save its reputation. He spent millions of marks bringing more Western rides. But it was all to no avail. Times were changing, and people's expectations for entertainment changed with them. The young were busy with Atari games, the adults could barely be bothered to leave their houses. With the decreasing traffic, the park was sinking deeper into the hole. The Ferris wheel spun with fewer people. The roller coasters that once had carried screaming guests were silent. The growing silence was a disaster for the amusement park. With no children, there was no fun. Nineteen ninety-nine was the beginning of the end. Vit raised the ticket price, but it wasn't enough. There were only four hundred thousand visitors coming to the park, not enough to cover expenses. Finally, Vit, in debt for eleven million euros, declared bankruptcy. The game for him, however, was not over. In two thousand two. 
he smuggled 20 containers filled with rides and equipment out of the country. By the time they learned Vit had set up a new amusement park in Peru with the smuggled contraband, it was too late. Since then, Spree Park has been witness to a deep stillness and a diplomatic knot. The lights are out, children gone, and the music has been forever silenced. We knew what waited for us at the end of the winding roads carved into the breast of the mountain. A legend, a very old folk tale written on the stones of a cliff protected by the winds. We didn't realize this legend would intrigue us this much. What we experienced on entering the village was indescribable. We were in Kayakoi, Nestled in the mountains, rising from the Aegean Sea, lies a village with stone-carved dwelling arranged like pearls against its bosom. We listen to the unfortunate story of an ancient village with a history dating to the Middle Ages. Its destiny was always to be abandoned. In the 13th century, this was a center for agriculture and trade, a strong city the Greeks called Levisi. It consisted of 3,500 households, two churches, and four chapels, and was home to Christian families into the 20th century. But as the world was interrupted, this idyllic love story too would end. Fate had brought division to the era, and in turn foisted the weight of endless yearning onto its shoulders. After the War of Independence, the Turkish and Greek states reached an agreement. The population exchange meant that the Anatolian Greeks would return to Greece and the Thracian Turks would return here. It was time for the natives of Kayakoi to say goodbye. They packed their belongings, but all their memories could never fit into a saddlebag. When they left their homes behind, the melancholy that sunk onto the city still remains. It wasn't the mountains that separated it from the Aegean anymore. It was war. The beginning of the 1900s was the stage of mass migrations, the results of war. Thousands of Greeks and Turks traveling for days, waiting on the cusp of a new life. But in the end, those who came and those who went were all filled with sorrow. The Turks who were placed in Kayakoi did not like it. Before long, they also had deserted it. Left behind by such unhappiness, it became a ghost village, haunting and frightening. No one no matter who, has been able to break the village's entrenched silence. Each passing season took a little bit more from the dwellings. Each house had its windows broken, then its walls shaken. The collapse was irreversible. The headless homes, their wooden roofs caved in, were left looking like tombs. Neighbors have come to share the loneliness. They founded and settled a new village. While they did not come too close, they paid their respects from a distance. A long path separates the two villages. At one end, people return to their homes every evening. 
At the other live ghosts that never leave. The fun times were over. First, we heard the footsteps of a majestic state. Then, we saw the traces of an unstoppable fall. We did not expect to find such a grand story in this little town in East Germany. We are at a garrison that supplied soldieries and artillery during wars that changed the fate of Europe. It was built about 90 kilometers outside Berlin. It had first served Imperial Germany, then the Nazis, and lastly, the Soviets. The only soldier remaining was captured in this painting, a well-preserved remnant of Soviet propaganda. We could find some imprints of every era. What surprised us most were the numbers. In its heyday, over 30,000 troops gathered here. Even the neighboring town of Uterberg today has a population of only 14,000. So how did they do it? Huge areas for military training and barracks were set aside, and hangars to conceal airplanes and bombs were built. The rumble of the tanks filled the rooms. Soldiers, waiting at the ready for the call, prepared themselves for death. The only way out was for battle. The penalty for escape was the firing squad. We came to film the past, but it was so alive it seemed we were in the middle of the Second World War. Time went on. Thousands passed under the shadows of these walls. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the deserted garrison never saw active duty again. Things left to disintegrate and walls to crumble. Visited only by the occasional explorers or the homeless, this place had nothing more than its doors, forever closed. Each stop of our journey seemed like a murky mirror, reflecting us back to ourselves. Whichever way we turned, we saw sorrow. Many inventions have changed the course of human history, but some more than others. The appearance of the steam engine turned the large and empty world into a little village. The Industrial Revolution allowed for the humming of rails to be heard from bustling cities to small towns everywhere. The 19th century was the golden gate for the European Industrial Age. But how was such an enormous network managed for years without a hitch? The answer lies with many stops, like the Skierniewice station. We are in Poland, a maintenance and repair station built mid-1800s by the Russian Empire. We hope the rusting skeletons of the wagons will tell us of the past. It can be seen all around. The memories here hold great pain, but also happy endings. Hundreds of train cars that once worked the line from Warsaw to Vienna are stored here in this depot. As part of the Russian development plan, 
they laid hundreds of kilometers of rails on the Polish steppes. Little did the authorities know that this prestigious project would be ruined by a terrible war a century later. Prisoners shipped to Nazi concentration camps were herded onto these wagons, designed originally to carry animals. These windowless wagons instead carried hundreds of Polish Jews to their deaths. Almost 90% of the people packed into these cars were taken to camps where they would be cruelly exterminated with poisonous gas. The trains that had once reunited loved ones and kept the economy booming now played a leading role in a nightmare. The fear of the people had seeped into the wagons on death runs. It was then that Skarnovica Station lived its darkest moments. It was one of the most difficult stories for us to recount. These iron hulks had witnessed it all. Now they lay here, far from any eyes, deserted and rotting. No one would want to ride these wagons again, but the station remained active after the war. After the war, the Soviet Union began to restore the depot at Skernovice and to replenish the locomotive fleet. For the next 40 years, this line saw steam, diesel, and electric engines run on it. The region needed to put the horrors of the near past behind it and start anew. Before long, the trains were back to doing what trains did best, carrying passengers and loads. The clacking of train cars needing repairs and maintenance become routine once again. New red bricked buildings were added, broadening the function of the station. While all was going well, the fall of the Soviet Union was also the end for the Skernovica station. It was time for it to retire. Many railway enthusiasts, who couldn't abide the destruction of so many memories, succeeded in conserving the buildings and the trains. They turned the station into a museum. As modern locomotives pass by, they always remember to pay respect to their ancestors. <laughs> <laughs>